Welcome to the Raise the Bridge podcast. I am your host, Phil Scrosso. Pretty excited to have a podcast. Uh, it's something I've been sort of interested in doing for a while. And then COVID hit. So kind of a time to force me to go for it, I guess. So it's been fun. I wrote a few songs uh, to play throughout. So every musical part you hear throughout the podcast are from songs called Tension Rising and Light of Day. So for my first episode, I have somebody very close to me who I play guitar with in the band Seosin. I've been playing with them for the past five years touring live and more recently been working on a new album with them. My guest is an accomplished producer working with bands like The Bronx, Senses Fail, Era, MC Rutt, and he also mixes a lot of the albums that he produces. He's also my tech support whenever I have a problem with my Axe Effects or Pro Tools goes down and I have no idea what it is. He gets the call and he's usually somewhat familiar because he helps a lot of other guys out. Everyone needs a guy like Bo. You can find him on social media as at Bo Burchell. Anyway, I am grateful to have him be my first guest. So here's my chat with Bo Burchell. First podcast uh, I'm doing with Bo Burchell. Am I saying that right? Have yeah. I ever said it right? Uh-huh. Out in uh, at Bo's home in Temecula. First off, I have to say I'm stoked to have you as my first guest, considering you interviewed me for a podcast. I did a few years ago. Oh, uh, what was it? The URL. Oh, so I'm returning the favor. Okay, and plus we play in a band together. That's true. Yeah. Which I know that you know that you, probably, know you that. probably thought <laughs> yeah. I was going to lead with that, right. but I kind of did. You know, just throwing you off a little. Right. So anyway, just to give people listening a little bit of background on. How we met was over 10 years ago through Cove, and I got to know the guys from going to seeing their shows, and then we did Soundwave together in Australia. So pretty much the only tour that we really did together. It was... I specifically remember beating you at ping pong every day on that tour. That's so weird, because I remember me beating you at ping pong every day. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> I mean, like... <laughs> well, maybe... Or was that on Taste of Chaos when... Yeah, I think I beat you both times. Yeah, okay. Sorry, for those of you that uh, don't know what we're doing, both we have this like ongoing joke that like we're both better at ping pong than the other person, and we, <laughs> and we both to refuse to admit that we ever lost. Yeah, so. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I won ev- every ping pong game I've ever played in my life. I'm pretty sure I've won. So. Well, I mean, I've well, so me personally, like I've definitely lost some, but like against you, I've never you. lost. Yeah, never, yeah. <laughs> never, never once. <laughs> Bo is a pretty good ping pong player, but he's also an even better pool player. So I'm pretty decent. I will, I will give you that. You, I feel like the first time we played pool, you let me win because mm-hmm. you have a history of being a pool shark from right. what I've what I've heard on the streets. So I was like, oh, I still got it. And then every game after that, you smoked me. <laughs> well, what's funny is my brother is like semi pro pool player he's like incredible at pool and like he has like these stories that you just would not believe are like real stories about him playing pool against people and just like like i think right now he actually has a guy that he plays pool against like once a week and i think he's won like almost 50 to a hundred thousand dollars off this guy there's just like some rich guy that like has money to yeah to lose at yeah pool. interesting well, and he just keeps thinking that he's gonna beat him is, wait a minute, is your brother his pool coach? It's purely like, I think I'm going to win. Like, yo, I've been practicing, let's play. And then he's just like, all right, cool, man. And then he'll like play him. And then he always just wins by just a little bit. Well, your brother has, from all the stories I've heard, he's definitely... He's got it down. What was our first tour? I feel like 2016, so like four years ago, we did the two-week Taste chaos, event. right? That was the second tour that we did. The first tour was with, we were in the van and on the East Coast, I think. Oh, I remember that. The green van or something, right? Yes, we were in a green van. So that was yeah. my first first tour. And I, the first show, I'll always remember it because 
It was Silver Springs, Maryland, and I always just thought, oh Sil- yeah, that was a good Silver one. Silver Spring, right, yeah. I, it was easy for me to remember, but that was my introduction to playing with the guys live. And ever since, it's always been fun. We did Taste of Chaos 2016, my second tour. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the best tours ever. It was so sick. Taking Back Sunday was the headliner, or Dashboard Confessional and Taking Back Sunday. Yeah. And then Seosin was third to the last. Mm -hmm. So what was the first guitar you ever had? It was a Charvel Jackson. Oh. With a reverse headstock in like a blood red color. Was it like pointy headstock or more of the like strat? No, pointy. Pointy. Yeah. And what made you want to get that guitar? Slayer. <laughs> but check this out. So of course, like every, and again, at that point in time, it was like a different time. You know, I mean, like I grew up kind of like in the church, kind of like you wanted to like learn music, you could like play in the, the church band, you know? Uh-huh. And it was like, yeah. so like, oh man, like I'm going to play guitar in this like worship band, you know? And wow. I, of course I show up there with a reverse headstock, Charville Jackson with a whammy bar and a Slayer sticker You're on a metal it, guy. Thinking yeah. like, yeah, uh-huh. I'm, I'm going to bring some rock to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Give and it the, some edge. Right. Yeah. The main guy there actually played in a signed, pretty decent sized band. Then he noticed what I was doing or like what I was kind of into or whatever. And he was like, after like a couple months of us like jamming, you know, and he was like, I am in a new band and do you want to play guitar in it? And again, at this point in time, I was playing with some other people, like playing like hardcore, just like straight excessive force ripoff type stuff. You know, Was this like middle school or high no, school? No, this is high school. This is high school. Yeah, I didn't get a guitar until high school. Oh, okay. So I wanted to play guitar, but then my parents said, like, no, you can't have a guitar. You're going to have to learn how to play piano first. Oh, so then yeah. I would have to take, like, a couple of years of piano lessons. Mm-hmm. And then it was like, cool, I feel like I've got piano down. Like, can we get that guitar? Yeah. And I think every time they were just maybe hoping that I would forget. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, that type of thing. He's going to fall in love with yeah, piano. Right, yeah. Think... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, totally. That's yeah, the guy wants thing. to, like, play in a rock band. Like, let's get him a piano. He'll probably, you know... <laughs> and turn into Elton John or like you know something there's corporate. more money you know, in piano than right. guitar playing I know so, I don't know if that's a fact but, but yeah. you can't gent on piano no. so thankfully yeah. <laughs> thankfully I didn't take up piano but yeah so I did piano and then yeah. uh, and then once I got done with that I was like can I get a guitar and they said no if you want to learn how to play guitar you have to learn how to sing so then they made me join a choir how did you feel about that? I was super bummed but it was just like alright but my whole life I've always been like alright if this is my goal. If the only way to get there is to walk through barbed wire, uh-huh. I guess I got to walk through barbed wire. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's just how I've always been. It was like, all right, if I have to join a choir, I'm joining a choir. So you you were still optimistic that someday you would get to the guitar, but your parents are throwing these little little hurdles your way. Well, yeah. I mean, I was still like, you know, like 16 or something. Yeah. So it was just like, I mean, what am I going to do? So I think that's, that's pretty awesome in a way right. that your parents sort of... Um, had you just picked up a guitar, you probably would never have gravitated towards the piano or singing. Right. Which are, as a producer, that's definitely a skill set that you want as many different um, capabilities right. of helping the musicians you're working for. Yeah, I mean, I have a very strong sense of harmony and like I, I arrange like the majority of harmonies that are on records that I produce, yeah. sing a lot of background vocals. Yeah, would definitely not have really learned a lot of some of those things, even though like technique wise is 100% not applicable to rock music. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, yeah. And if you are singing that way in rock, it's like usually pretty lame or it's like kind of a gimmick <laughs> for sure. So yeah, finally did the choir thing, did that, and then finally was able to get a guitar. Did your parents buy you the guitar? Oh, you know what? And actually, you know what? No, as I'm going through it time-wise now, the red guitar was not my first guitar. It was like a knockoff SG from like Best Buy or something, like before yeah. they even sold real instruments. So it was like some crappy SG like, knockoff, SG knockoff with, like, with like an even crappier little amp that probably came with it. And the whole package probably cost, knowing my parents, maybe no more than $150. <laughs> and that was just uh-huh. how it was. So I had that thing. And I think instantly it was just like, dude, this is not good enough. Like, I can't, I don't even enjoy playing this thing. You know, so then I think I saved money and finally convinced them to let me get a better guitar. And then once I did get the better guitar, joined like the church group thing. Yeah. And the guy was like, all right, this is cool. But like, dude, you're, you're not just going to be like trying to pinch squeal like over like our worship song. You Metal guy, a, chill out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, like, and then I got an acoustic. And like the like the pastor guy like took me to go pick out an acoustic. So I got a 
this Epiphone acoustic, which was actually rad, and I have no idea what happened to it. Uh-huh. In the early days of Seosin, like I let somebody borrow it, and now it's just it's been gone. gone. gone but it's like yeah. one of those guitars where, like, I still talk to a couple people from like that early time period, yeah. and it was like I remember that guitar sounding so good. It's just one of those things where I just lost it. So this guy it sounds like he was inspiring to you. I mean, kind of your mentor in a way. Yeah, Did yeah. You say he was the yeah, guy? big time. Yeah. Did you take lessons at all, or no, no, Mm-mm. never, um, never took a guitar lesson? I don't think so. No. At one point during Seosin, we took. Um, I think I actually I'm looking at the book right now here for some reason. There was a period of time when we were like on tour for like <laughs> a couple years. Can I borrow, borrow that book by the yeah. way? <laughs> we were like on tour for like a year straight. You know what I mean? So then we were like, well, let's push ourselves. Like, let's sign up for Berkeley College of Music <laughs> and like just take online courses. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I took two semesters of like theory, then like guitar theory stuff at, at Berkeley. And I was just like so bored. What's so funny is I'm taking from Berkeley mu- uh, the same course? Theory and Composition 1, the very like first oh, starting yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing that right now. You know, I think it's just important to keep, you know, learning new things. Yeah. Well, and I think at this point, see, I think that theory is like so much better to learn after you're already like an established guitarist. I think that like if you learn theory to begin with, I feel like it's a crutch a little bit. Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's kind of like my tastes and like what I enjoy is already established. Yeah. Now I'm just able to like identify those things. Yeah. Knowing, oh, that's what it's called. Right. Or like, uh, yeah, I kind of already do that. Right. Not to, you know, speak ill of people who go to school first to become a musician. But I think that kind of takes away like your imagination, just kind of creating on your own, just what feels good and right and being just kind of structured too much with that, I guess. But I I think, like you said, later in life, going back and sharpening up those things is very beneficial. Yeah, like you said, like not speaking ill will, but I do feel like it's better to learn it later because later I feel like here's your whole world that's like this chaos and you kind of know what's cool. We're going to give you a way to like categorize and classify it. Yeah. Whereas like in the beginning, it's like you don't know anything. Here's your (laughs) rules. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Uh and like, I feel like in those formative years, like I would have never done any sort of like those weird moves that you're just like, I don't know what this is, but it sounds cool. Yeah. Like you would never play those. You would never stumble on those chords going like, oh, you know what? You know what works the one, five, four? It would be this. You know what I mean? Like you would (laughs) never think to just go like, I don't know what I'm doing, but this sounds sweet. It sounds cool. Some of my favorite parts like I've ever written are accidents. Right. Just noodling around and then it's like, okay, I kind of know where I'm going. There's like a placeholder thing I'm doing. But then it's like, oh, I wasn't really paying attention. And I hit the, like, what fret was that? Right. Or what, you know, and so you were doing the church band. You were learning a lot from, uh, what was his name? Rob. From Rob. And at any point, did you start thinking or exploring the idea of doing a band outside of this, like doing your own thing or doing a band with Rob. So that's when Rob asked me to join his band. I think early on, like I started taking summer school classes and I actually graduated high school a semester early. Oh, you're one of those guys. And went, (laughs) yeah, and then went on tour and like toured with, you know, that band Switchfoot. Yeah. So uh, Jerome, the bass player of Switchfoot, used to be in a band called Fold Zandura we were on the same label as them and we toured with them. What was this band that you were playing for called? Cosmos Express. And we were like a Britpop band. They were kind of like My Bloody Valentine Mm -hmm. type stuff. Um, But yeah, so yeah, went on tour with them and like toured around the US. We didn't do any international stuff, but did a ton of stuff with them. And- You're 17, 18? 18. 18, yeah, Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Same thing for me, getting out on the road (laughs) right after high school, yeah. Right. And were you interested in writing? Yeah. Or, okay. Um, yeah, so he wrote the, the whole first record. And then the second record, I felt like I wrote some stuff, but I was credited with arranging. And I feel like it was more just kind of like I added some stuff to it. But like since I didn't really write like the core of the song, uh-huh. nothing that continues to, to pay. Noodles by Bo. Right, mean, exactly. I would yeah. love to see that in a record. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then it was that. And okay. then so I did another, I think we did two albums and like maybe a couple EPs or something. Okay. And then by the end of it, I was like demoing the songs, just like us demoing stuff as a band. 
And I felt like they were turning out to sound pretty cool. Yeah. Like, hey, guys, let's kind of record these demos. And yeah, yeah. I mean, like, even though he would write them, yeah. but instead of us going to it, you know, because at that time it was like you had to go to a studio yeah, to, to demo. Go. Home recording was Did not, not exist. a yeah. thing. Yeah. I convinced my parents to let me remove my bed from my room and I would just sleep on a couch in yeah. order to make room for, because, you know, it's like, you're like when you're growing up in your parents' house, like your bedroom is like 10 by 12. It's like, oh, yeah. so I convinced them to let me take my bed out of a room and I would sleep on a couch so that I could fit like a little recording desk in there. I lined my entire room with carpet and then uh, ran a snake cable out of my window. And I was a second story in a condo, ran a snake cable out to the garage. Uh-huh. And like set up a band just jamming in the garage. The room, okay. And like we would get the cops called like every day pretty much because we would just be out there jamming. Uh, so I would basically have to be like, okay, cool, hit record, run downstairs into there. And like yeah. then we would all sit down and start playing together. And just together. hope it th- that it's still recording. Yeah. So at this point, how did you obtain any recording knowledge? Because there, I mean, what did you read? Right. Well, no, because we had done two albums in like big studios. Okay, so you got the experience. Yeah, and we like our, my first time going into a studio was at the studio in LA called Front Page, and it was like, I believe Guns N' Roses did part of Appetite for Destruction there, and like while we were there, Cheryl Crow was in the next room. But so, yeah, so that was my first experience, and like yeah. the whole time I was there, like I actually didn't get to play on the first record because the producer didn't think my playing was good enough. So he was had the other. Tough? It was a little tough, but at the same time, it was just. I've always been like somewhat okay with, all right, well, clearly Rob is like a way better than guitar player. You looked player up to Rob. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah for and sure. It, and the producer was just like, yo, dude, this dude's not going to cut it. Yeah, like, Rob, yeah, come sure. play this. You know what I yeah. mean? And it was like, oh, hmm, bummer. Okay. Um, yeah. But then he would come in and just like, boom, and just nail it. And I was like, yeah, he's better. It wasn't personal. You, that's that's great, obviously, yeah, yeah. because you could have just been like, "Screw this, I'm right, I'm out of here." Like, I yeah. don't want to be in this band. But you did you take that as like a lesson that hey, maybe I need to brush up on my skills and I did improve. No, no, <laughs> it actually pushed me into like the well, if I'm not playing guitar, like what's the what's the tape machine doing right yeah, now? Yeah, okay. So, so it was kind of like, oh well, if I'm not good at this, what is what? Okay, so oh, I see. So like the drums, like are you putting reverb on this yeah. to make the snare drum louder? And like had no idea what. I was talking about well you kind of found uh yeah that's when i truly new... like was excited about recording and yeah. i was like i think i like this a lot and i just love being in the studio yeah i mean obviously here, whenever you're in a nice studio you're just like i just want to stay here all day oh I don't you're know. surrounded by guitars and like stuff it's a it's a vibe it's that environment of when we grew up watching our favorite bands in the studio right. you're like we're doing that now right but now it's now it's the same thing but just at home <laughs> Yeah, yeah, same thing. So it's it's less exciting, but it's cheap. It's cheaper nowadays. To, right. And you, I think it's good for musicians to become more self sufficient. But at the same time, when you really get that studio vibe, like we always track professional, like real right. drums in a studio, and I'm so excited for it. Yeah. And I don't. Maybe it's just because we grew up that way and had that experience. Because I'm finding more and more, if I'll kind of like talk to like uh, I don't know what I would call like a baby band. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like one of their questions is always like, so do we just like program drums or do you like record them or what do you do? You yeah. know? And, and for me, it's like always just like, wait, what? That's what's like, I guess more of the norm now, you know, like people are just kind of like, yeah, this is our album. Like, well, what did you, you self produced your album? Like, what did you do? Well, both our guitar players like recorded the D. All right. So lost audio for a second. <laughs> We're learning. We're figuring yeah, it yeah, out. Getting all the hiccups out. The, yeah. With the studio producer engineer. That, that, okay, that's honestly why I had you as right. my first guest for the troubleshooting. Well, well and also to be fair, uh, we could have recorded this through my rig, but you wouldn't have learned anything. Can, you know what I mean? True. Like just throwing me into the fire. This way, you're prepared for the next time, and it's gonna be great. For people that don't know, Bo is also my tech support for <laughs> anything when I'm recording guitars or my Axe Effects isn't working or something. Right. Bo gets the call. I, well, what's funny is I'm that person for like not to uh, not to make you feel small right now because um, <laughs> you are very special to me. Thank you. Um, but like I'm that person for at least like six people that I know. I figured, and yeah. I love it though. Yeah, I know you do because every time someone calls me, it's like literally the only time I ever talk to um, JB from August Burns Red is about Axe Effect stuff. Half the time, it's just like I have never heard of this problem before, and then I get excited because I'm like. Let me call you back. I got to figure this out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually producing a band from remotely from Arizona. 
and there on the Axe FX 2 XL. And which is funny because I had to remember how like the whole rig works with the blocks and everything. Because on the XFX 3, oh, you're on, are you on 3? Or? I'm on the 2XL. 2XL. Because it's the 2 space. But yeah, for the 2XL, there's no input and output blocks. But on the 3, yeah. there's output blocks. Oh, okay. So on the 2, anyway, sorry, I'm, yeah, bo- yeah. I'm boring everyone in their entire <laughs> world here. But anyways, technical stuff, like the way they do certain things is like a little bit different. And I'm like trying to troubleshoot with this dude about like how to get me a clean DI plus like the amp. And uh, I was like, yeah, on your output block. Like, what? And he's just like, yeah, I don't see it. And I was like, oh, yeah, you that's don't right. have it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So back to the young, we were talking about the young bands that you work with. Yeah, and they'll just deliver a, a drum MIDI and guitar DI. Guitar DIs. And they expect you to reamp generally. Yeah. Know, just your vibe. Which to yeah. me is very scary. Because, I mean, one, I mean, and you know, too, as a guitar player, it's like when you, when you pick an amp and a guitar, you normally play depending on how they interact together you know what i mean and like depending on the gain staging that's there and like how tight the bottom end response is that maybe it's just because of the world that we grew up in Mm -hmm. you know for us it's a very interactive instrument you would think that it's just like well it's your di there's a signal and it goes into an amp and it's just it, what comes in is what comes out. Even how far your palm is from the bridge determines how much low end is in there. Oh, yeah. And yeah. all that is determined by what you're monitoring coming out of your amp. Yeah. You want to know something I noticed recently is uh, wh- like which leg my guitar is resting on and how I play because that will change how my right. wrist is angled. Yeah. What do, you, what do you normally gravitate towards? The bottom of my guitar resting on my right leg. That's comfortable. Mm-hmm. That's as if like you have a short strap and you're you're right. like a gent guy playing yeah. with your guitar really high. But my the angle of my wrist sounds better with the guitar on my left. Same. See, I feel like guitar on the left plays better also from like an ergonomic standpoint. Because yeah. mm-hmm. you're just like here, you're just right up at your shoulder, your arm is just perfect. But I feel like I look so lame. Yeah. Whereas this on the right leg is like way more cool. No, I mean, all those little things make a big difference. Yeah. And especially, you definitely need a good tracking tone, at least, um, yeah. even if you're going to get reamped. Yeah. Well, especially with like crescendos, especially too, mm-hmm. because like, you know, it's like a little part and you're just, <laughs> and you want to know the dynamics of how it's going to distort. And depending on how uh-huh. much gain you have going in, like you might go way quiet. So that's that's something that I've ran into. So, but but what I'm getting at mm-hmm. is like sometimes when people hand me just a DI, mm-hmm. it's like scary because you can do so much with a DI that mm-hmm. like in one aspect very liberating and like exciting. Yeah. But also for me, it's like really scary because I have a thousand options. I have a thousand ways of getting this wrong. You know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, and when I'm delivering the tone back to the artist, it's like, how do I even know what direction to go with this? Like, what I sure. think sounds good for the mix mm-hmm. probably may not be the tone that he had in mind. I don't know. Have you had any like nightmares with that, or no? You're just nervous about that initially. I'm I nervous guess. for that when that time comes that I'm just like I'll reamp it and I'll spend all this time like dialing in the amps and being like getting really excited about something, mm-hmm. and then I'm nervous for the day that comes and they're just like, this is not what we wanted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But thankfully, a lot of the stuff has been the reamp stuff has been like the the old long or like the kind of foreign pain stuff that we were listening to mm-hmm. and like really like heavy and big. So yeah. it's like that normally gets like the fifty one fifty or and the Marshall. What's, and it's like, the, are those your go-tos for for the heavy? I like those a lot. I feel like all of my amps could do it, you know. But also too, um, the eight hundred and the fifty-one fifty. Most people have had good experiences with those. I mean, those are yeah, tried and true. So yeah. when I say, you know, when they're like, "Wow, the guitars sound great," what'd you use? And if I say, "Oh, it's like an old eight hundred and a fifty-one fifty, they're like, "Oh, well, of course it is. It sounds great." You know, so, but if I were to say like, yeah, like I used any of my other amps, they'd be like, ooh, yeah, like I heard, I've heard a bad demo of one of those amps before. And now all of a sudden in their head, they're thinking of something else Mm -hmm. and it's like a total mind game. Have you reamped or uh, tracked with like on the digital side using Axe Effects? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know live you use Axe, yeah. But I guess in a recording environment, you got the heads. Why not right. just stick with those? It depends on the genre. Yeah. You know, like for metal, I would say I probably prefer Axe Effects or like digital because you can, you know, it's like with metal, everything is so manipulated. I call it, I mean, it's like audio Photoshop. It's like <laughs> you just have to be like a Hulk. Metal can get away with a lot in a, yeah. in a way. Um, I mean, just think about a kick drum. 
I mean, like, yeah. have you ever stood in front of a kick drum and heard the sound that is what we all know to be the recorded <laughs> kick drum sound of a metal record? Like, never. For the most part, like, no. No. <laughs> They're always like, thum, 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 yeah. thum. and then you hear it, like, recorded with, like, triggers and everything on it, and you're like, that sounds awesome. Yeah, you know, so, up. Um, But, yeah, I feel like you the can get Dr. Feel-Good kick drum right. sample. Yeah, but yeah. same thing with rock, too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, even snare drums, it's always, like, Def Leppard. You know what I mean? Like, snares don't sound like that. Which I love. Me, that too. Mud Lang's just like, right. we know it's not real. Who, right. Who cares? It just sounds like out of this world. Awesome, And yeah. And that, I, I'm like, it's a bold move to do yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, so how long did you, after, what was the band again? Uh, Cosmos Express. Cosmos Express. How long did that last? A couple years. And yeah. then uh, the drummer that we had turned me on to Sunny Day Real Estate. He was the world's biggest Sunny Day Real Estate fan. And I was just like, dude, this stuff is sweet. Like, I like this kind of music, whatever this is called. I had only listened to, like, metal, basically, because that's what kind of, like, got me into playing guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, m nothing, like, too extreme, you know? Um, and then, like, hardcore. But then Britpop, that like Oasis and Blur and Ocean Color, all, all those bands really opened me up to like, whoa, these are like songs, you know? And then like, of course, like Third Eye Blind and all like the, around that time when all these bands started coming mm -hmm. out that were like just pop bands pretty much. But I just loved it. Yeah, Sunny Day Real Estate kind of like changed me a little bit. And then when I heard Jimmy World Clarity, it was either Clarity or Static Prevails, one of those records. I was just like, I can't do anything else. I need to go be Jimmy Eat World. I need, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, this, I can do this that. is who I am now. Because I was just like, Rob, like, I don't think I can continue doing this band. Yeah. This is my passion now. I was like, yeah. this is who I am. I was like, man, this is it. I'm, I'm doing this now. Yeah, so quit that band. Played in like a couple like, you know, basically want to be Jimmy Eat World bands for a mm -hmm. couple of years. Writing and, songs? Kinda? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like yeah so then I started yeah. writing. Okay. So wrote a bunch of songs, played in bands kind of like around Orange County. And then from there, met a guy, Zach. Me and Zach started writing songs together, but kind of like went more emo, pop punk type stuff. And then we stumbled on Open Hand and we were just like, Open Hand is awesome. And then we became like Open Hand su super fans. And then found out that they were looking for a guitar player and a bass player. So then me and Zach drove up to LA, tried out for Open Hand, got the gig, yeah. started playing with Open Hand for a little bit, toured with them. And then I started playing like a song that I had written for Open Hand at a rehearsal one day. And the singer was just kind of like, oh, that's cool. What's that? And I was like, oh, it's this jam I'm working on. Yeah, and I was, yeah. like, I was so excited. And he was just like, all right, cool, whatever. And then I was like, oh, I've got it. So we're never going to be able to write for this band. So and actually what I was playing was uh, Seven Years. So wow. I was playing seven years for open. So that, that's why a lot of translating the name sounds like it could be very open hand. Yeah, they're, they're, it was relatable yeah. in a lot of ways. Because I was writing it for that. Course, so then, yeah. Uh, yeah, so then basically I was just like, oh, I get it. So then me and Zach quit and then started Seosin. Was Alex the drummer of Seosin playing for open hand yet? Yeah. At that time? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so and that's how we met gotcha. Alex. Gotcha. Okay. So we, we tried to get Alex to quit with us. So and, you stayed with Open Hand when you yeah. and Zach went to start Seosin. Yeah. Were you going to school for recording or anything? No. You, did you ever? I took two semesters of recording classes. That's actually how I met, what do you call it, Eddie and Tepe from Thrice. We were, school went was to it, Orange Coast College. Oh, okay. And we were taking a recording yeah. class with this guy, Sean, who owned the studio World Class Audio in Anaheim, where I like ended up recording a bunch of records at. And he was the teacher there. And it was funny because like, Pro Tools had just come out. And he was preaching about how, like, you know, guys, trust me, like, you got to learn about digital audio workstation. This uh -huh. is the future. And yeah, and, yeah. like, he was, like, showing us this, like, crazy computer he had. And it was like, this thing will let you import eight tracks of audio. Eight. And yeah. you can once... Well, give it about 30 minutes <laughs> and you can actually cut the audio and move it. And we were just like, what? You know, and it was like, it was like in the very early days. Uh -huh. So, um, but of course me at the time, I was just like, dude, who, this guy's a joke. Yeah. Like we're not yeah. recording on a computer. Like, like I'm in a ba I was in a band. Like, <laughs> I was just up in LA doing an album. Yeah. All right. Like we were like on a real record label mm -hmm. and we were doing it to tape yeah. on a console. And you're telling me that it's going to be in a computer. You're wrong. Sorry. So you didn't embrace it so much. Didn't didn't care. And I, so, but basically from that point on, I just figured he didn't know what he was talking about. And so okay. like, you know, I would like take the tests and stuff. And like oh. some of the, I think, like I didn't get a very good grade. I think I failed. 
Yeah. You know, because I was just like, oh, this guy's full of it, you know. Gotcha. Um, but, you know, now I'm like great friends with him. And he was on to something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. then I retook his class maybe like a year later, mm -hmm. maybe, and then aced it. Because then I was like, oh, okay, I get it. He understands. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he was right. All the studios are closed and tape machines are gone. And, and these computers are going to be right. in every musician's home for right. them to record themselves. Yeah, but I don't think that was necessarily correct in the timeline. It did. Yeah, so, the timeline of everything. Yeah, I think I took the class at Orange Coast, the first one, right out of high school. So like oh, we, okay. did, we did gotcha, like a gotcha. tour or two yeah. okay. and then came home. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, well, we're going to be home for a little bit. I'm going to take, a, take, another take class. a class, you know. So you set out, you have all these songs that you were trying to write for open hand mm -hmm. and you're like, I'm going to do my own thing. Yeah. And when did you decide that? Like, I need a singer. How was that process? Like we tried getting everything. so many people, like so many and even like Orange County based yeah, musicians, even guitar that, yeah. players, drummers, mm -hmm. everybody. Did you always want two guitar players? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I love harmonies. Okay. And like, <laughs> and uh, did, has to did be you like, want three guitar players? Did you want four guitar <laughs> players? wanted five. Let's be five. real. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um, we wanted a guitar quintet. Someday. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like tried everyone I knew. And it was just like, hey, like I'm starting a new band. Do you want to like join it? Everyone was just like, bro. I'm already in a band. I was up in LA doing an album. Right, I know, right? Yeah. I mean, but that's literally yeah. how it was. And like yeah. everyone, and it was like, you know, I'm like asking like Brandon from Bleeding Through, you know, yeah. kind of adding, asking, and like we were talking to like, I think I may have tried to ask Keith or somebody from Throwdown. I don't know, but it was like everyone we could think of. For sure. We were just like, yo, like, do you want to join our band? And everyone was like, no, nah, we're already in a touring band. You know what I mean? It was just like, oh man, it's so hard to find people. Finally, we found, well, I was referred, so I recorded a band called As Hope Dies, and I saw them play with Justin, our original guitar player, mm -hmm. was playing guitar for them, and I was just like, this guy looks like a rock star, you yeah. know, like, he should be in our band. Mm -hmm. So then, me and Zach asked him to join the band. He did. I want to say this is already, like, after the EP was recorded, or, like, the majority of it was done, because he did come in and, like, play some stuff on it, like, some harmonics or something. Yeah, yeah, um, okay. Then he joined the band, and then like within like a couple weeks, some stuff happened between Justin and Zach, and uh, Zach like couldn't really forgive him for the stuff that happened. So Zach decided to leave, and then like a week later, we found Chris, and then uh, Chris, who's still in the band today. Yep, yep yeah, mm -hmm. Boosty. Oh, but before that, we found Anthony, and then we had this drummer Pat play on the album because like I said I was trying to get everybody to join a band and no one would so I just figured like well if no one's ready to like leave a band because it's an actual band then I need to convince people that I actually have a band and then they'll <laughs> want to join it after I already have members if I have it like what's the easiest way to get a drummer that I want well I guess I just have to already have a drummer and then someone will want to be my drummer you know what I mean like, it, was, it was like so backwards is, thinking yeah, yeah. so yes yeah, so we had uh, Pat play on the record okay. and just crushed it and then once we had the album done then it was like hey alex do you want to join our band now and he was like actually yeah yeah, yeah and it. it was just like really like i can't you believe that prove worked right via the recording like oh right. yeah like we got it we yeah. with that first ep because i always thought it was alex um just because the drums are so much more technical yeah than like everything else at the time yeah, and it, it's crazy looking back that my perception of Seosin was like a hardcore band because you guys always played with hard. When once you right. started playing shows, you were always with Orange County hardcore bands. Right. I feel like, but then it was like, no, no, no. It, it's there's heavy moments, and the drums are technical, like a metal drummer. It's like no, but it's just that kind of clean melodic singing and right. ambient guitars at the time. But then it's heavier guitars right. and guitar harmonies. So that whole m mixture of everything is kind of what made you guys more unique right. at the time. We always consider ourselves like kind of like a hardcore Bjork. Yeah, no, I, I think <laughs> I think that works perfectly. Yeah. So Anthony, how'd you meet Anthony? So the studio that I was telling you about where I recorded all his albums and is owned by Sean, the teacher. So he recorded a band called Days Away. And Days Away is this guy named Keith, who is the singer of Good Old War. He's like the guitar player in Anthony's solo band currently. Gotcha. So anyways, so I was actually trying to steal Keith to sing for us, but I didn't do a very good job explaining it. And I felt bad like asking him to leave his band. I was like, hey, yeah, so I have this project, you know, and it's kind of like looking for a singer, like kind of a unique voice though. Like, you know, somebody that sounds like super similar to you. And, uh, and he was like, actually, yeah, there's this guy. We sound kind of similar, like I'll get you his number. 
don't know, some stuff happened, and then I ran into Keith again. Ended up, they were on tour with Starting Line, I think, and they were playing at the Glass House. And then so I asked Keith, like, it was basically like, yeah, like, do you know anybody? And he's like, no. So anyways, he was like, yeah, I don't have his number, but this guy Dufresne does. And I was like, who's Dufresne? Yeah. And he was like, oh, well, he's like our weed dealer. Oh, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> so I was like, talk to this guy Dufresne or something. And like, the he, weed dealer knows yeah, every he knows everybody. Scene. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I get Anthony's number and like I call him. And of course, at this time, this is like maybe like 2001 or so. And it's like, there's no cell phones. Yeah, I had to like call like a landline that like uh, wasn't his number, which now thinking about it is like so awkward, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, so called and was just like, hey man, I got a band. Like, can I send you a CD? Have you cut some stuff on it? <laughs> landline. Like, CD. really weird. Yeah, no yeah. email, you know? Like, <laughs> so basically, I sent him the CD. We call him to follow up. From what I remember, it was maybe like a week or two go by with no response. Sounds like Anthony. I'm pr- <laughs> yeah. I know, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure the CD got there, but we haven't heard from him. And then we called his house, talked to his mom, and it was like, yeah, I'll have him call you. No call back. You know what I mean? And I was just like, man, maybe he hates it. Yeah. And then in classic form, we get a call from Anthony. It's like, dudes, oh my God, I fucking love this shit. This is my shit. Yeah. You know, like so fired up. And then it was like, we were like, amazing, cool. And then I want to say it was like another week or two of like radio silence again. And we were just like, oh God, okay. So, you know, I think at this point it's been almost a month or so, you know, because like it feels like an eternity of like, oh great, this isn't going to happen. So I actually have, I found the original Anthony demos that I sent him. Oh, nice. With his original (laughs) performance. So yeah, these are are still just like demos and yeah. i think at this point it was just me and zach like sending anthony the stuff you know before we even had like the fully tracked stuff gotcha okay anyways he sends us the stuff back like and out of the blue we just like receive a cd in the mail you know yeah. and it was like oh, that's weird he didn't even tell us he was sending it we get the <laughs> cd and it's just like and at first honestly i was a little like i don't know yeah like i can't tell if it's amazingly good or if it's bad. Cause like when I listened to it, it was like an uncomfortable feeling. It was it was something that was like so unfamiliar. You know what I mean? Especially and the anticipation is so built up. Yes and no. For me, it was more just kind of like, this doesn't sound like your average man fronted rock band. And yeah. I was really scared. Yeah. And it was yeah, just kind of yeah. like, okay, like I've never experienced anything like this before. Like <laughs> this, this is, is a strange. Real commitment here. Like I don't know, you know what I mean? Cause yeah. some, you get a new experience and you're like, I don't know. If, like, it's like eating like a really fancy food. I don't know if this is really good or really bad. Can somebody tell me if I should like this right. or not? Like, yeah. what, do, what yeah. do I focus on? But then, yeah, like after like maybe an hour or so of listening to it, both me and Zach were just like, I think it's incredible. So then we both unanimously were just like, this is amazing. Yes, let's move forward. Awesome. And then yeah. uh, once we had like finished recording all the instruments, then we flew him out to California uh, sang on the EP maybe like three days or something like that, yeah. maybe three or four days. And then he flew back home. From that point on, like I finished mixing it and doing everything. And then we had the friend who was like managing us. And then we got a booking agent. And then it was like, we were just instantly on tour. Was there a label involved at the time or no, just the manager? Just kinda? our own, yeah. So was that sort of the start in, you know, your home? town area orange county la i mean it's no i think we only played like two or three shows before you did like a national tour yeah or okay one of our first shows was like opening for goldfinger in arizona and it was because john feldman was like trying to sign us he's like yeah come out and Uh do this you know whining and dining yeah yeah we drove out there and then played the show but not with alex it was before alex had joined gotcha played that show and it was fun and then came home and I think maybe like our second or third show was at Showcase. We got added to Noise Ratchet. The first show I ever saw was Noise Ratchet. No way. I love Noise Ratchet. Yeah, for sure. we loved him too. And we were main support for Noise Ratchet. We played Everyone Left after we played. Yeah. And it uh, was like really bad. I mean, like we felt like total badasses, but at the same time, like, oh, that sucks. But I think at that point, we knew that like something was happening. And then we... Went on tour forever. Like <laughs> one of our first tours, check out this lineup. Taking Back Sunday, Headliner. <laughs> yeah. My Chemical Romance, oh, okay. main support. Monine was the opener. Okay. We were second. So your first national tour is not even opening. Yeah. And we were getting guarantees and everything. And it was Taking Back Sunday, right? When like Tell All Your Friends had already been out before My Chem had done Three Cheers. We just knew that like, wow, we're on tour and like we're playing stadiums. I mean, they were like 1,200 seat venues. You know what I mean? Like when you're at that level, you're just like, 
This yeah. is this is a stadium. <laughs> you know, like this is the biggest we'll ever be. Yeah, we've, we've peaked. Yeah, you know, like this is insane. <laughs> Overnight, we have our own dressing room. Yeah, you know. How long? Because I know shortly after you lose your singer. Yeah, yeah. I think we did a couple tours, and then I think we did a short little like like a two week tour with Every Time I Die and Story of the Year, and then we were all set to go do a full U.S. main support tour with story of the year and it was like right when until the day i die came out so they were just like Not mtv yeah. MT- like yeah and yeah. it was a very like i mean and on i mean i think i've talked about it before but like i was very mad at anthony like when he quit i took it like he pulled the rug out from under me like dude we were about to go be the biggest band in the world we were main support playing like 2000 seat venues this mm. is even bigger than the last stadiums yeah. we were playing i mean all the all your peers were right taking it to the next level yeah yeah, yeah. You know, and we were being quartered by all these huge labels and stuff. Yeah. And then when he quit, I was just like, no way. I definitely took that bad, poorly, For and sure. like was angry at him. But now we're all made up. What was the next step to kind of keep things going? Did you did you want to keep things going? Or like were you yeah, just Yeah, I mean, like I think, and- I think me and Chris, well, yeah, we tried out a bunch of people, yeah. which I also just found like a bunch of <laughs> tryouts. Like I've been like yeah. going through like cleaning hard drives and backing things up. Yeah. Yeah, so we tried out a couple different people. And then for a while, me and Chris even thought about singing, but then really just got down to it. Like, I can't play and sing at the same time, yeah, yeah, at sure. least some of the parts. And I'm already, like, as you know, I mean, like, I, I live, I play, like, a lot of the easy stuff so that, like, <laughs> I can do some harmonies. So Yeah, I mean, because for those who don't know, like, Bo sings a lot of the harmonies live. And then when we've played, was it You're Not Alone? Some of the yeah, yeah. songs off of that record, Bo just straight up sings the songs and Anthony just plays bass. But even still, like Chris has to sing the verse because there's like a little bit more of an intricate lead <laughs> uh, guitar yeah, part. Yeah, and yeah. like as soon as I start trying to sing and play these weird leads, my brain just gets noodled. I feel like Phil from Story of the Year filled in or mm-hmm. something. Was, yeah. was there any singer before him or was that kind of like the next step? No, nothing was really like an actual possibility. Nothing really like that we were like, oh yeah, this is this feels like it could be good. So Phil was the first one that we thought it could be good. Um, and then we got that just cd in the mail from cove that was written on it point no last name no just cove. just cove i mean the only cove that i right. know in the world but i was still so upset with anthony i thought that it was anthony playing a trick on me because we got it in the mail and i was like this is anthony what a, what a jerk <laughs> i would believe that you know Knowing and anthony now well, yeah. and honestly like his original i think he did mookies or something like but it was just him on an acoustic you know, almost like it was just done like on a cassette deck, like, and he was playing acoustic. So it was very hard to hear like the intricacies of the voice. And I was just like, this is totally Anthony. He's totally messing with us. <laughs> so at first I was a little upset, but then I listened to it. And I was like, oh, it's actually pretty good. So, yeah. um, yeah, obviously we loved it. So we followed up with him, brought him down to the studio and had him record. And then we did warp tour, like a couple dates to like kind of try him out. Cause we were still very like scorned girlfriends at that yeah, point. Yeah. And it was like, all right, well, we got to make sure this is going to be, be cool. And then, you know, and of course, you know, it was at that point, it's always so funny looking back because you realize how ridiculous you are, you know, <laughs> but at that yeah. point in time, it was like, well, we're pretty much Metallica and like, we got to make sure our fans like accept <laughs> you, you know? And you're just like, dude, you're like uh, yeah. a small band. Like nobody yeah, cares. But there's everything you're doing seems to be working for the most part. And just for a little bit of background, uh, I went to high school with Cove. But I never knew of Cove as a singer at all. And then, so I went on doing my thing at 18 and got on the road with As I Lay Dying. And then from afar, I hear, oh, Cove joined this band, Seosin. I'm like, doing what? <laughs> He's singing. <laughs> Cove sings? I was so shocked by this. Right. And I was proud too at the same time. Right. So that's kind of where I picked up with uh, like really paying attention. From Warp Tour, where did things kind of lead you? You didn't have a full length yet. Mm-mm. So was that kind of the next phase of yeah. focusing your attention on a full length mm-hmm. album? Yeah, and then everyone involved was kind of like, what are we doing now? What's, what are we doing? So it was full focus on the band. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean... For the most part. This was like 2003. I mean, this, yeah, this 2002, era 2002, yeah, 2003. Okay. At least from my memory, I wanted to kind of like keep doing it myself because I felt like what we were doing was working and people liked it. And I didn't want to be kind of like committed to a label unless it was going to be like, okay, well, if we're going to do Warner Brothers and they're going to give us like a million dollars, then that'll be worth it. If it's just going to be like a regular like record deal where it's like, hey, we're going to pay for your album and then you get to go tour 
It's, you it's were kinda already like, doing that. I'm like, uh-huh, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I can record our album for free. Like, what do I need you for? And I've already recorded our album, and we're already doing it, and we're making 100% profit rather than 10% profit. Like, why would I give you that? So I feel like Bury Your Head was before your the album, right? Yeah. Was that sort that of... That was like our first song with Cove. With Cove. Um, and I remember that having a huge impact on yeah. like the scene and just... I was especially excited to hear Cove sing for the first time. Yeah. And did that sort of get the attention of Capitol Records? So we had already been in talks with everyone when Anthony was still in the band. And then once Cove joined the band, we knew that we had to like put something out that would be very good. Obviously, that's always the goal. But as soon as we put that out, everyone was right back at the table. Like, yeah. oh, okay. Seems like people are digging it. We're back in. Yes, then we decided to go with uh, Capital. Knowing, because at one point, As I Lay Dying was being, what's, what's the word? Courted. Courted. We got the, hey, there's interest in you guys. But it was like, whoa, the next, you know, going to right. a major label, which is for a young musician is just like, oh my God, like it's insane. And I remember talking to Cove a lot about the process of, should we consider it? And I know Ron Lafitte yeah, yeah. was, he was the guy talking to us. And uh, did he sign you guys? So Louis Bandek, signed us okay but honestly when ron lafitte told us that he saw us as a metallica yeah. that's what sealed the deal that's for what me. he said to us right yeah. he's like you know like i was road managing metallica or megadeth, or megadeth. Or yeah, yeah. and he was just like you know i see you guys as a metallica and i was like tell me more <laughs> you know what i mean and i was just like yeah you guys just keep doing your thing because he's you know what happened with metallica is you know they just kept doing their thing and, you know, they made the Black Album basically because people begged for it. They wanted them. Yeah. People wanted Metallica on the radio, so they just had to give them something. Okay. So what you're saying is you're not going to push us to radio. We're going to get to do our own thing, and then radio is just going to come to us. He's like, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I was like, <laughs> this is incredible. Like, yeah. this is exactly what I want to hear. Ron Lafitte was a good salesman. Yeah. and and But every yeah. other label was like, you know, we're going to throw you in the studio with this huge producer, and, like, we're going to get big singles, and you guys are going to be huge. Yeah. And then Ron was just kind of like, do your thing. Do your thing. And when you get big, if it's three records from now, whatever. It'll happen sometime, you know what I mean? Because I believe in you. And we're like, this is amazing. So yeah, we were like, yeah, let's go with him. This episode of Raise the Bridge is brought to you by Golden Lantern Coffee Roasters. I've recently been trying their Golden Hour and Columbia Beans, and I can say that I am a fan of what they're doing. For more great coffee, brew guides, contests, and swag, check them out at goldenlanterncoffee.com and at Golden Lantern Coffee Roasters on all social media. Stay grounded, stay humble, stay caffeinated, stay golden. Golden Lantern Coffee Roasters. The only reason we didn't sign with them is overall opinion was a little too premature. Mm -hmm. Uh, We owed Metal Blade one more record, but we were so close to signing with Capitol. Yeah. How did that lead to Howard Benson working with you guys on that first record? So I wanted to produce the record, but after the record was record deal was done, yeah. it was like, well, you, we're throwing a lot of money at this. We got to make sure you guys go in with somebody that's tried and true. So we met with I don't know, a bunch of different people. Every I just didn't feel like anyone had anything to like really offer. And honestly, Howard was the only person that came back and like sat down in a room with us, and f- it actually felt like he listened to the songs. And the fact that he was just kind of like, you know, you guys have a lot of the songs in the same key. Like, you know, I noticed, you know, songs, whatever, one through this, you have like six songs that are all in the same key and two songs that are in this key. Like, I feel like you could mix them. And I was just like, this is more than anyone's ever told me. Okay. Yeah. You're like, oh, okay. So we have a lot of songs that have open chord, you know, like, yeah. oh, okay. But yeah, at the time it was just like, wow, like okay. this guy actually pays attention to us, yeah. you know? But yeah. So then at the time, and I think I was like a total like jerk. Were you fighting it? Uh, a little bit, yeah, you know, yeah, but yeah. I also loved Blindside Silence. Oh, such a great record. And P.O.D. Satellite. Great record as well. So yeah. it was like, okay, you did those. Well, that's enough for me. Those are great. What studio did you guys work out of? Bay 7 in L.A. What was the general vibe of making the record with Howard? And and was it... Uh, I think it was good. Plotnikoff, was that yeah. the engineer? His... Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, I think it was good. There was a lot of stuff I would have done differently. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I was treated like a child. Yeah, I was satisfied at the end of the tracking stage. Mm -hmm. However, like, you know, at a certain point after tracking a record for two months, you're just kind of like, I "I give up. 
yeah. like whatever, man. Just <laughs> let me out of here. Over. You yeah. know, I've had enough. Like I don't want to ever quad track another guitar again. You know what I mean? Like, and of course, too, like no EverTune quad tracking with no EverTune on yeah. stuff, uh -huh. and you're just dude. Okay, you know, two weeks of just eight hours a day rhythm guitar. Whose idea was that to quad track or theirs? I mean, I get it though. I have the multi tracks for the record. The guitar, it's actually surprising how sloppy the guitars are. But and also too, like no guitar sound by itself actually sounds good. Like they're all like surprisingly. You could play sloppy with a bad tone, but you track it four times. And it becomes good. And it's good. Right. Wow. No, yeah, it was a weird yeah. thing. Like, cause I've been, I'm redoing all the guitars and well, I'm basically retracking every Seosin song, <laughs> doing guitar playthroughs for everything. And yeah. I'm referencing all the multi-tracks to make sure wow. I'm playing everything uh -huh. properly just listening to stuff like how was this not caught i mean or were we just really that bad like was this the best performance we could give yeah yeah so there was definitely that i mean because like, at first i had a hard time like handing off the trust but then i was just like yeah. you know what i just gotta hand it off like yeah. they're getting paid i'm not getting paid to like scrutinize over this it's not worth it for me but yeah so uh overall it was pretty good but then we went to go mix and i remember first day of mixing chris lord algae mix yeah yeah the whole thing yeah okay yeah who did the mastering uh, our boy, Ted Jensen. Ted Jensen? Yeah, yeah. love Ted. Um, I got to watch Ted master our latest record, yeah. and it was like the master of mastering. Yeah, yeah. I think he mastered it like four times. Yeah, the first time was like way too loud, and then the second time was like way too quiet, and the third time was like okay, but like something was wrong with it. You're getting there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the label was super mad at us for like wanting it remastered so many times. Was your budget comfortable? Well, I mean, we were already over budget. We had six weeks to track the record, and then we went two weeks over on vocals. So it was uh, it was a lot of money. Did you feel, was there excitement of like, all right, when we're going to, you know, release date's going to come around, we're going to start the tour cycle? Yeah, yeah. What was the kickoff? Were you guys doing mostly headliner, or were you doing some support or mixture? I saw you guys a few times. Yeah, I think we did like Taste of Chaos, cycle. maybe. That was like That's another right. yeah, big yeah. one. So we did the very first one, which oh, I think okay. was the used my cam taking back Sunday, yeah. maybe. Uh -huh. Kill switch engage, under oath, us, okay. census fail. But it was yeah. the very first one. Very first it was one, like yeah. Stacked. And we did the second uh, yeah. the second year, so followed you guys, yeah. And then we did I want to say we did the third or fourth year after yeah. that again. Yeah, so that was great. And then we did a bunch of headliners. Yeah, did the whole world thing. The best is like my, or my favorite is like the Jap the Japan interviews. You oh, know, when yeah. it's like, it's like straight up like uh, loss in translation. Like you'll get asked a question, right? And yeah. it's like the person interviewing you is like saying the question, right? Yeah. And it's like, they're talking like for 45 minutes. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm totally exaggerating here for <laughs> yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as you, when you're sitting there, it's like, it feels like they've just like recited an entire novel. And yeah. then the interpreter asks you like, so what was it like flying here? And you're like, it's like, yeah, yeah it's like, yeah. dude, that's not what he said. You're like, uh, yeah, it was cool. And then they speak back to that person like for another 30 minutes. <laughs> and you're just like, there's no way. Like, yeah. like yeah, something's definitely getting something. crossed here, yeah. you know? So yeah, but that's, those uh. are probably my, my, <laughs> my favorite ones. Cause I always feel like I'm getting messed with, Yeah, you know, like, going, like, like, like they're totally talking crap on me right yeah. now. Like they're <laughs> making fun of me guy. right now. Yeah. yeah. So everything's going great for the band and then record two. Mm -hmm. And you took on, uh, no, you guys worked with a number of producers, right? Yeah. So yeah. we, um, basically after this, after the first record, we looked back at the finances and it was just like, dude, we paid so much money for like nothing. Like, okay. Like what did we enjoy about the process? Well, I think Howard got good vocal performances out of Cove, but like we weren't happy with like the way the music recording went down. Okay. I don't think that's worth $500,000, yeah. you know? So it was like, we we're just going to track the music ourselves, have yeah. Howard do the vocals. And then he said yes to that. And then when it came time for us to actually go in, he got cold feet and was like, no, I need my whole team. It's my whole team or nothing. So we were like, oh, okay, well, whatever. Uh -huh. So then we live streamed the whole record recording process at Hurley and tracked the majority of the record and then did five songs with Butch Walker, I think, five or yes, six. that's what I remember. Didn't get the vocals finished again. And then two or three songs with John Feldman. And then me and Chris did a couple songs, I think. But so yeah, it was sort of like this Frankenstein. Yeah, because process. basically we had, after we had done the, the Hurley sessions, Ron Lafitte had gotten fired. Everyone had gotten fired. Uh, so we got changing, kind of yeah. passed over to Virgin. Uh -huh. And the new guy at Virgin, it was basically us, 
30 Seconds to Mars and Red Jumpsuit Apparatus, which uh -huh. were, you know, both of those bands are radio bands. And we were just like, we are so far from those bands. Like, we're, we're never going to be a big radio band, mm -hmm. like, just from our sound. And they were just like, well, if, you don't ha if we don't hear any singles, the record's not going to come out. It's just not worth it for us to put it out. And we're yeah. just like, but we, ha we, we haven't put out a record in three years. We need to put out a record. We need to get back and tour. And they're like, yeah, well, that's not really our problem. And we're just like, yeah, whatever. It's not even worth it for us. A couple hundred thousand dollars to do a record is not even worth our time. So how did that affect morale without having your team of the Capital guys, Ron Lafitte, who uh, just knowing Ron could just lift your spirits oh, and terrible. get you so motivated. So now you got these Virgin guys who just are being handed don't really have an invested interest in yeah you we guys. yeah nobody even liked us there man that's so just, that sucks so much yeah so yeah. we um so yeah it really like pitted chris and i against each other because we're both you know like both chris and i are like somewhat alphas yeah, and yeah. i always submit to him <laughs> um, just out alphaing yeah. the other one yeah. yeah yeah it really turned us into like okay well we wrote a song and oh dude at one point we had this a and r guy that like called me on the phone and told me to rip off filter Hey man, nice shot. Uh -huh. And he's like, you know that bass line? I'm like, yeah, the defining bass line uh -huh. of that. He's like, what if you guys took that bass line? Okay, hear me uh -huh. out. And then you put like some sick drums to it, bro. Uh -huh. Like Alex, you know what I mean? Like that picture that. <laughs> and I was just like, so you want me to plagiarize a song and then put different drums on it? And I, and I was just like, oh my God, dude. Like I'm so, can I do one of those? Too? Yeah, our sponsor for today's show is Topo Chico. Oh, yeah. So yeah, so basically we had all these demo. <laughs> I'm gonna edit that out. That did not That's explode in, that, all over yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we had all these demos, but like the label was never satisfied with the the vocals because they were always looking for the radio hit, and it was just like, dude, well, that's not our band. Yeah. And then so it started pinning us, pinning me and Chris against each other. Did you guys try writing singles? Mm, yes and no. So well, yes. After it got to the point where of like we hear the songs you have and it's not worth us to put this record out. Yeah. So it was like, well, we have to write singles now. So and you at least gave it a shot. To yeah, but, but you know how it is. As soon as you try to write a single, everything sucks. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're like, oh, what's going to be good? Oh, man. You know, what yeah. are people going to like? Yeah, you're just shooting in of... the dark. And especially at that point in time, there wasn't really like a... I feel like now, if you want to be radio, all you have to do is kind of like incorporate some vocal trills, <laughs> uh, add some electronics, make sure the chord progression is really easy. And then maybe add like a slow halftime, not too heavy breakdown. You know, do you when you write a song, do you try to keep it at a certain length of no. time? Uh -uh. Knowing the songs that we do live, I'm like, oh, there's like they songs always in the end up. There's yeah, they always yeah. end up being the same length. But I think that's just due to like, okay, well, like I'm going to a pre-chorus because now I'm getting bored of the verse. And I feel like it's just, that's our attention span. So it's like, well, I'm ready for this time. And maybe every song I get bored of the verse after 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, move things along. Yeah. Because I always have this conscious effort. If I've gone over 3.30, what am I doing wrong to get there? It just kind of reminds me when mm -hmm. I just look at the timer. I'm just like, if I know I'm consciously going over, but I'm like, yeah, but this bridge has like, it's got a solo it's section, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's got guitar harmonies, it's all... And some of those songs are the biggest As I Dying songs. Right. So I'm like, it is okay to do that, but most of, I'm just always mindful of keeping things tight and concise. That's what I'm meaning more for you guys. Single world, single mentality. Now the, Nowadays, I'm hearing it's like at three minutes. Yeah, um, nowadays, it's like if you want singles, it's like second verse has to be like half verse. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then right back into the chorus. So do you ever feel like you... you satisfied the label with the single i what was the changing yeah. was yeah so, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we were super bummed it's it's not one of our favorites you didn't feel like that was the best you guys could do or it's just not like what we enjoy the most yeah you know like for us the yeah like songs like voices or sleepers mm -hmm. you know you're you're not alone like yes, that yeah. to us is like what we like or even now, you know what I mean? With like a silver string yeah. or racing toward a red light or any of pretty much anything yeah. of those. And then I remember at one point, did you leave the band or did you stop performing live with the band? Yeah. So uh, I was just like not really excited about the like the reviews that we were getting from people, you know, because I would be multi-tracking the band every night and like listen. Oh, you're talking about in a live sense. The, yeah. The, yeah. And, uh, and I would listen to the recordings every night trying to improve, you yeah. know, like, okay, how can we make this sound more like the record? Same with us. Are my harmonies on point? Like, what are we missing? Is everything good? And 
you know, on like a Tuesday, like let's just say like we played Los Angeles or somewhere, right? And it's like, I listened back to the multi-track that night and I'm like, dude, we crushed it. Yeah, I mean, Cove could have done a little bit better, but then seeing like the review the next day of like, wow, Seosin really sucks, yeah. you know? And it's just like, dude, are you crazy? Like, we crushed it. I mean, yeah, I mean, Cove was a little off, but so that like really bummed me out that it was just kind of like, okay, I started feeling like way underappreciated in the sense of like, it doesn't matter what I play, no matter how good I do, people only care about the singer. hyper focus on, on Cove, yeah. yeah. Which was a lot of pressure. I, I right. understand for him. I always thought he's he's not a singer. He didn't grow up. I didn't right. know him as a singer, but he pursued it being in a professional band on a major label right. debut And there are hard record. songs to sing. It, he really had like a lot against him and i definitely admire the fact that he he tried but yeah people just kind of hyper focusing and once you kind of get that you hear like oh they're not so good live right. everyone just buys into that right. and believes it and and that's just kind of the the narrative that they you know tell themselves well and i think there was a lot of you know anytime something starts getting like a lot of like positive feedback mm -hmm. i feel like there's like the natural pushback to yeah. be like i actually don't like it i have a feeling maybe if you guys were with capital on the second record yeah things would have been great yeah totally maybe uh, uh, generally I, I would probably tend to think so morale wouldn't have been crushed as much with right uh yeah certain things and or at least the way i envisioned it going had ron still been there and like his initial sales pitch would have kept continuing the way sure. it would have been yeah um that was there but then i started getting more work producing so then mm -hmm. i think the band wanted to do like a b or c market tour like in the middle of winter and like i think they <laughs> proposed to do it in a van uh -huh. and i was just like dude no way so during that exact time frame that we got offered to do that thing the like the and and it's like basically there's a b and c markets right oh, so yeah. it's like uh -huh. so uh i'm trying to think of like a city that like everyone would know so like los angeles is and this is for all people like around the u.s <laughs> well, right yeah, yeah so los angeles is an a market i love this game and then like <laughs> so outside of los angeles would be like uh pomona is that a b or c uh pomona i'd say is a b okay yep and then maybe like uh bakersfield uh -huh. would be like a c market uh -huh. so so there's A, B, and C, and they're like level, there's like tier levels of like how the, bas yeah, basically like the touring community, like your booking agents classify these cities. Yeah. They like rate them. You yeah, know what I mean? So sure. it's like, okay, this is a C market because you're going to draw 2,000 people in LA, but then outside of LA, you'll draw 1,000, and then you go to Bakersfield and you're going to be playing to 500 people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. but it's just based on the population and how hip the city is that's the thing it's it's, it's like, not not saying anything negative about these cities it's just because a lot of those up, shows are set up sick. differently of course yeah. oh man some of the my favorite shows are in the most random obscure cities and yeah and it, a they're deprived of a lot of shows right so they really appreciate it when you come and play their city mm -hmm. and uh and you find a, like some gems of like really awesome venues. You're like, yeah. oh, in Spokane, they have this great venue. Yeah. Right? All that being said, when you're looking at it, maybe in my position where I was, it was like, okay, so you're asking me to get in a van in the middle of winter, which is like super dangerous. Yeah. And it was like all East Coast. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was like, okay, sea markets in the East Coast in a van in the mm -hmm. middle of winter. And, and, so, and the other thing about sea markets is like why we kind of like maybe... I'm kind of like describing it in a negative context right now is yeah. basically because if you're on tour, you know, and you're playing a markets to 2000 people, you're making a lot more money for sure. Yeah. At night because you're playing for more people. Yeah. So to me, I looked at it like, okay, so I'm going to take a huge pay cut being gone on tour after just getting married and then like, <laughs> you know, turning down production work to go risk my life in a van in the middle of winter for your band that is getting negative reviews right. that is like kind of crushing your right. morale. So I was just like, okay. And then I think I got a call to like mix a record and it was like, hey, can you mix this record? It's going to take you like two weeks and we'll give you like 20 grand. I'm for sure not doing that tour. I'm staying home. <laughs> and then I paid our guitar tech, Ken. Ken Floyd, yeah. Yeah, to just play the shows, you know, because he was already out there. So I just paid him to play the part because he already knew the songs. Of course, yeah, yeah. And I was like, hey, guys, this will actually be a good thing because it's one less person taking up room in the van. Ken's yeah. already there. We love him. Mm -hmm. Great. He can do it. So, um, yeah, so that everyone was super mad at me too 
for doing that because they're like you like bailed out of doing yeah, man. something that we all didn't enjoy. Yeah, we're gonna go suffer. You think we all want to do this, right? But I mean, yeah, you had to. You know, your priorities were different, right? Was it just I'm sitting out this tour, or like I might be potentially done with the band? There was a certain point where I think I had told Cove that it was just like, hey, I'm getting super frustrated at the whole review thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. everyone is saying that we collectively as a whole, like are not good when I know that I'm good. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Or at least, at least that what I'm care. listening to, yeah. what right. I'm listening to back on the multitracks every night, like my perception is that I'm pretty good. You're doing your job. Yeah. yeah, yeah and it sure. was really disheartening to have like people that weren't paying attention to that say that us collectively as a whole was bad. Yeah. And it's like, you know, to be on tour for, you know, 24 hours a day you pretty much live for that one hour that you're on stage. Oh, and I was just, and I was like, you know, like Cove, I love you as like a friend, but like, you're really ruining my time on stage and it's making me not like you. Like, like I'm having a hard time, like detaching those two things. Yeah. I'm, I'm starting to attach that to you. And as a backwards as it sounds, it's like, hey, I want to save our friendship. So I want to like kick you out of the band. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, it's like such a backwards thing. But you're breaking up with yeah. somebody you know and it's not easy <laughs> yeah it was, yeah it was really tough so yeah cove exits the band mm-hmm. and yeah what was the mindset what was what were you thinking was the next move i just can't do it anymore like i'm 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 done i can't like go out and have these reviews saying that i'm bad yeah i was like oh i'm i'm probably just gonna not be in the band anymore. and you had studio work so you you at right. least had another you know job well, and that was the thing on. it was like okay i can't deal with like these people that like don't even know me saying that i'm bad when i can go produce a record and like i'll have five guys in the room every day telling me that i'm the best thing ever you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah. it's it's like such a more enjoyable experience mm-hmm. you know and you're creating music and then and then you do those records and people tell you how great they are and it's like a really enjoyable experience so I remember at that time you had done MC Rut. Mm-hmm. I, I knew uh, that you'd done Pass the Flask, mm-hmm. the Blood. What, what were some of the like pinnacle highlights that you just are very proud of those records? I don't know. I guess another big one would be Drop Dead Gorgeous. I did that record. Or what? It, what like records you were happy with the process? Because sometimes, hey, that they're not the most successful records, right. but you're just like. I loved making that record. Right. It was just a great experience. That record was a good one. Mm-hmm. I engineered a record for a producer, Michael Beinhorn, who is like a huge producer. He did Marilyn Manson's Mechanical Animals. Wow, yeah. And uh, Ozzy's huge record, Corn Untouchables. I don't know, just massive dude. Like mm-hmm. you look him up and you're like, oh, wow, you've done every band's biggest record. And it was like a really interesting experience working with someone that's like, how are you supposed to make a record for under a million dollar budget like that's not even possible you know and i'm sitting here like yo we can make this thing yeah i'm like we can make this thing for 20 grand like Mm -hmm. what are you talking about you know so we were both learning from each other and that was a really enjoyable experience i think it took like almost a year to make that record though okay because it was like you know that same type of mentality we went to a studio recorded the keys and it was like got the files back threw them into the mix and he's like the keys don't sound right we're gonna go to a new studio and re-record the keys keys <laughs> yeah and it was just like the keys really That's like, it? like yeah really you know he's like yeah i don't like the key they're not they're not sitting right and it's like okay we'll go re-record them with a new person playing the keys you yeah, know how like much is it today gonna cost right yeah but that was just the way it worked you know like yeah. i think we re-recorded the vocals for it like three times at three different studios wow. and it was just like nope they're not right the delivery's not right and then it was just like, sang him again. And then it was like, no, they still don't feel right. Sing him again. That type of old uh, school yeah. mentality, you know? Not like today of like, we got to get it done. We got deadlines. We got to move things. Or like, like close enough, we can fix it. Yeah, 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 we can doctor it up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've, I feel like every record I work on is the most fun I have. Mm-hmm. I rarely have a bad experience. So if you had the choice, go on tour or be at home and make records... What would it be? Both. You can, you can only do one. Well, I mean, that's kind of unfair, though, because, I mean, you're saying that if I go on tour, I can never come home. <laughs> <laughs> I did not think of it that way when I asked it. Okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll stick with both. <laughs> you, yeah. Oh, you have to tour 12 months out of the year. Yeah, you 13 do. months yeah, out of the year. Yeah, you leave your family or stay home. Yeah, hmm. sorry. To me, they both, they satisfy two totally separate elements of my life. I mean, obviously, too, because if you're on tour all the time, you're never creating music. 
So yeah. it's like, that would be, cause I mean, to me, studio and live are two totally different things. Different mindsets completely. Yeah. Yeah. And two different ways of connecting with people. There's something special about like standing on a stage and like looking at people and just being like, yeah, that like, energy. And is, you have no yeah. reason why you're both screaming at each other. You're just like, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And we have no idea what we're saying. Yes. And you're about. out, you're just trying to out energize each other in right. a way. And that's, that's what I love. And it, it just, it's such a captivating feeling to just be like, I'm getting more excited from your excitement right. and yeah. then there and you know it's like reciprocal yeah um, and one thing just to mention every time that we're playing a show and i look over and i see you and so many times you have the biggest smile and right. i'm just like i'm usually in my head thinking i'm like oh i gotta nail right. the part, blah, blah blah and i'm like and it makes me like chuckle right and that's one thing i love about playing with seos and is it's a good time on stage like right. it's always just fun exciting and I mean, Anthony loves just coming over and biting me sometimes and or just shaking me. He's like, I don't know why I do it. I just feel right. like biting you. I'm like, I'm kind of trying to nail this part. So. Right, yeah. <laughs> you bite a little softer next time. Right, yeah. But it's just, it's so much fun playing with you guys. And I think that's maybe something for me being, um, you know, the newer guy to the fold, seeing your fans react with such, like, just they love the band and they love supporting you guys so it's it's a really cool thing for me to be a part of yeah yeah i like having you too because i always oh. feel like uh i feel like my guitar playing has gotten way better since you've been in the <laughs> band because like knowing how good you are at guitar like i'm not gonna say you're an a plus just because we know that there are we both know there's people better than I can us, maybe right? That. You know maybe, what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> we have to admit that there's people better than us. I will try. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. ping pong, different story. Oh, okay. Back different ping story. Pong. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But like, yeah, guitar, we have to admit. So that's the okay. only reason why yeah. I'm not giving you A+. Plus. Okay, okay. So if you're an A, I would put myself at like, a B or a B minus. Okay. Podcast so, over. Yeah. That's all, that's all I wanted to get out of you. <laughs> but you know what I mean though? Like, and when yeah. you're playing with someone where you're just like, wow, like they're so good. And like, and I have you yeah. loud in my ears too. Yeah. Which and I'm just like, me I'm like, oh, you're playing so well right now. And like, it makes me play better. Kind of the same way for me. It's just like, it's not as technical. Right. So I can just, I can really enjoy it, but it's still like noodle fest. Right. Still such dynamic playing that I've always, um, before I was even playing with you guys, was always like man the guitars are like having fun right you know yeah they're yeah. not hard to play but they're just kind of fun they're active they're, yeah. they're doing things yeah, yeah. so seosin takes a chunk of time off mm -hmm. you know you lose cove yeah and then i remember hey they're back right shows and, and anthony's back mm -hmm. how did that even happen like chris had been talking to anthony over the years yeah so just friend just yeah because chris never chris never got super mad i think chris understood he's always like the more level-headed guy mm -hmm. you know um, yeah i know i was <laughs> yeah i know so i was like way more emotional and took it terribly yeah um in 12 um, years or something has passed at this time yeah, right yeah yeah and then it got to the point where it's just like why am i even mad at this person there's no reason you know what i mean like and in general i'm just like now in life, I'm just like, there's no reason to be mad at people. It's just, it makes my life worse. It's a waste of time. Yeah, man. like, there's no reason. So I made up with Anthony, and then uh, we just started talking. And all of a sudden, it was just like, yo, let's do a record. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, we got songs. I'll do it. You know, like, don't tease me with a good time, you yeah. know? And then uh, sent him some songs, and then he sang on them. And it was like, wow, this could be cool. And then it was yeah. kind of like, well, let's play a show. Let's play a couple shows. All right. Well, is this feeling good? Like, cause, and I think too, what was good is like both with me and Chris, like having careers, we don't have to do the band. So I think that's kind of what makes it special. You yeah. know, like if you're going to do it. You're going to be happy doing yeah. it. And I remember that was the, the first meeting that when I met up with you guys, you said that, and I was in, in that kind of same boat. I wasn't doing right. as they dying. And I was like, man, like we're all, like same page right you now. And I, it felt refreshing. Right. So. Especially when there's not a lot of stress, like, okay, we have to do these things. Cause you know, sometimes it can kind of take the fun out of it. So, um, yeah, it was just like, man, this feels great. Like we should, let's do a record. Reverting back. Yeah. Just me and Chris. And then you guys doing, yeah. Yeah. Just me and Chris just kind of like wrote all the stuff, sent Anthony some demos. He liked them, sang on them, yeah. sent them back. And then we kind of like finished them. And then, uh, it was just a very organic, easy process. And then, yeah, put the record out and then did Taste of Chaos again. Taste no. of Chaos. Yeah. I think we hold <laughs> the record. It? I was going to say. We hold the record for most Taste of Chaos, is oh, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, also, most uh, consecutive nights at Chain Reaction. Yes. And I will just <laughs> like to say, for the record, I feel like 
I have played Chain Reaction more than anybody ever, any individual. Right. Because we did the four shows, right. Sayosin. Uh, I mean, this is about this is about you. Never mind. I've, right. done, I've, right. done, I've done a lot of shows at Chain Reaction. You're the host. All uh, right. It's your true. show. You know what? I'll do it in my wrap-up. Yeah. Anyway, how have you been using this time to still be uh, productive? Because obviously you can't really have bands coming around in the studio. Right. Bands aren't really working. I mean, I guess they can do things on their own and send you stuff to mix. Mm -hmm. But just seeing from your social media, yeah, you're getting more involved with playthroughs, right. more gear-related stuff. Like, is that something that has been easy for you to just be like, yeah, because it, this is an interest of yours already. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just going to, you know, focus your attention on these things. And do you enjoy it? Yeah, it's something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. But yeah. unfortunately, I mean, I guess, you know, one of the fortunate or one of the downsides to like really dedicating your life to like recording mm -hmm. is that you don't really have any time. And yeah. then you combine that to like family and kids and you're like, you know, usually my day consists of like, so, so <laughs> such dad mode right <laughs> what now. What you got? Yeah, 0% yeah. rock star right now. <laughs> um, so waking up 6 a.m., mm -hmm. kids, um, my wife works customer support for like a clothing line. So she works from 6 a.m. until nine like by herself, like answering emails and stuff. Yep. So I handle the kids from like six to nine, come out here at nine, work from nine to five or nine to six, mm -hmm. come back in, handle the kids from six till 8.30. Oh. She's, she works from six till 8.30. Oh, okay. And then we meet up at like 8.30 or nine and like hang out for like an hour or two I, yeah, before I, bed. But nine to five is a good chunk of time for work. But I mean, yeah. But it really yeah. doesn't leave a lot for like, extra stuff yeah you know uh, but yeah. the great thing about covid though is i've been getting to go on a lot of bike rides that's awesome because there's a couple other dads from like my daughter's school mm -hmm. that ride mountain bikes and since they're not really working a ton you know it's like we all have free time and usually yeah. i'm the only guy that has free time because i'm just like well i sent out mixed revisions in the morning and now i have like two kinda, hours kinda to wait around yeah yeah so now it's been great. Now I get to go on mountain bike rides, like, you know, whenever I want. Do you feel like some of these little changes just from the necessity to, to adapt with COVID, do you feel like you'll implement some of these for like the future? Would you want that? Like, hey, maybe I can work a little bit less. I things. wish I could, but when it comes to mixing, I totally can. Because yeah. I've, I mean, I always, it's like you send out mixed revisions and you're just waiting around. Yeah. But a band here. Yeah, a band, band here. Band, yeah. yeah. I mean, because, you know, even with that, you know. Um, especially I do so much like out of town bands, bands that travel and have to pay for lodging. And, so yeah, it's no like days off. Yeah. I mean like the every day off is a paid day for mm -hmm. them. So it's like, I mean, I have trouble even just taking one day off. So I'm doing six days a week usually. And it's like, even that is like over the course of three weeks, it's like, man, well, that's like, that's like four days of hotels that we're paying for that yeah. we're not working a lot of non-musicians don't realize that when a record's getting made, it's like, oh, it's, you're firing off on all cylinders, yeah. like, cause you just have to. And you, and like, yeah. And then, and then of course there's always like, I know we said we would have all songs, 10 songs finished, but we actually only have eight. Of course, those last two songs take the entire last week and you're just stressed, like trying to finish those songs yeah. because they already have plane tickets booked to go home. Yeah, man, you got to be very diligent with the, the scheduling and yeah. um, deadlines and all that. Yeah. To kind of wrap things up, uh, just to kind of go through your endorsements and gear, like I know you, I can't even say the guitar, Balaguer? Balaguer. Balaguer. Yeah. You've been playing them for a few years mm -hmm. and you have your signature model. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, <laughs> if you want, yeah. you don't have to, you could say pass. I mean, what's to say? It's a, <laughs> it's a, kind of a Telecaster style guitar, mm -hmm. which I really love, even though I've always played Les Pauls mm -hmm. throughout my entire career. That's how I kind of knew you. Yeah. And then I think in like, yeah, 2010, when the band kind of stopped, I just was so active in the studio and just started playing every guitar imaginable. Yeah. Just kind of became like, oh, you know, I kind of want to try a Tele. Oh, tellies are great. Just yeah. got my first telly and I, yeah. oh, it's my favorite. And, but you know, honestly, I think the thing I like about it is the scale length. Mm -hmm. Just the longer scale length, because yeah. um, for you non-guitar players, you don't know, like <laughs> uh, Gibson, the Les Paul is a 24 and three quarter inch mm -hmm. length Very com of strings. Very compact, compressed. And uh, the Les, uh, and the, the telly is 25 and a half. Mm -hmm. And then I have that black baritone, which is my new signature that's coming out. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So that's a 26 and a half. And then you can see it's just barely longer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then I have those new surf green ones that are going to be my other signature model yeah. that are coming out. My birthday's in September, by the way, I'm just saying. Oh, you know. right, right, perfect timing. Is that when your new guitars come out? It could, it could be, yeah. <laughs> I'll send you a, a link for a coupon, 10% off. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, so... Uh, yes, yeah, so that's been awesome. Yeah, no, Joe was working at a company. I was one of the first people to play his guitars. Okay, And yeah. he was at another company and offered to make me a guitar. And honestly, again, going back to the whole, like, I see myself as a much worse guitar player than I am. I've always played Les Pauls because I feel like they were the least amount of flashiness available. Yeah. And I always played like just a black Les Paul, like don't look at yeah. me. You know what I mean? Um, but that's like to guitar players, it's like he's playing the Holy Grail, you know? Well, yeah. Like, yeah. So, but I also loved it because it was classic, not I'm, flashy. I'm more the same way too. Yeah. I, I, you know, I play strats now, but when I used to play, I still have fans that come up. Remember when you used to play the Les Paul? And I'm right. like, yeah, I kind of loved that. Yeah. Right. So he offered to make me a guitar, but it was like the company he was at was like way more flashy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Almost like BC Rich looking, you know? And I was like, yo, dude, like I'm sure they play amazing, but like I'd rather just chug along on my le my clunky Les Paul yeah. uh -huh. and not be Gets flashy. Done, I'm like, yeah. I just won't. I'm like, you can make me one, but I probably won't ever play it. I'm too yeah. embarrassed. And he's like, all right, no problem. I respect that. And then he started this new company. He was like, hey man, can I make you a guitar? And I was like absolutely can we do something normal and he's like yeah, yeah how about like a telly style and i was like awesome yeah let's do it so then yeah he made me that and then i actually just gave away the very first prototype at our storytellers thing in garden yeah. grove but i did ask him if he wanted it back and he was like nah man you can have it like i'm mm -hmm. you know i'm sh i'm making way better stuff now and i was like are you sure you don't want it like just for your wall or something yeah. you know and he's like nah you can have it hold on and i'm like well do you mind if i give it away um, cause I'm not playing it. Yeah. You know? And he's like, yeah, go ahead. Whatever. So, uh, you bring up Fishman's it's got, it's uh fishman modern, modern influence, modern influence. because of you. So <sighs> yeah, funny I'll, story. I'll take that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I don't know if I told you this, but like, yeah. So the first rehearsal you showed up and you had yeah. the 5150 uh -huh. with your guitar, yeah. your Charvel San Dimas, right? So, uh, you know what? SoCal. I, I get confused. So okay. I, yeah. The strap body. You showed up and I was like, dude. Like when you left to go to Jimmy John's to get a sandwich, yeah. I was just thinking like, dude, your tone sounds so sick. Like, why does it sound so much better than mine? And I always considered myself to be like a tone snob. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like every venue I've ever played, everyone comes up to me and is like, yo, your tone was great. And that's, you know, when I was playing the Hughes and Kettner, uh -huh. just yeah, yeah. Hughes and Kettner out of the Hughes and Kettner cab, you know, vintage thirties, but it's like very common thing. And, uh, it was just like, man, your tone destroys mine. What is going on? So I went over, I, when you were gone, I actually went over to your amp <laughs> yeah. and, and plugged my guitar into the 51. And I was like, maybe it's the 5150. So I plugged into the 5150 and I was like, it's closer, mm -hmm. but it's still not there. Okay, well, and then I took your guitar and plugged it into your amp and I was like, fuck, there it is. All right, yeah. okay, okay, well, maybe it's the combo. Yeah. And then I took your guitar over to my amp and I was like, there's that character you know what I mean? and then instantly <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's when you came back and i was asking like hey what pickups are in there? yeah yeah. Uh -huh. yeah well what pickups were in your guitar at the time so before it's Fishman's, always been stock so you went okay it's so it's always uh, been the stock so a good upgrade to yeah the fishman's yeah. and um i was emgs before it, but once i went to fishman it's just the dynamics of um, i think for high gain they can't be beat exactly yeah like impossible shout out to fishman modern yeah. influences and mr ken susie for lacing us up with sick pickups um strings um i'm ernie ball axe threes axe three is mm -hmm. your yeah fractal axe effects is what we play live that's what we play have you ever messed with kempers no yeah. mm -mm. Mm -mm. i've always seen just the axe three and you have the science of the axe three down right so yeah. Why mess with that? From what I understand, Kemper doesn't give me the flexibility of to deep dive into the parameters of the individual amps. Like, yeah. like for instance, you can download a tone, mm -hmm. but you're kind of stuck. One one time, a person did bring over a Kemper, and we started messing with it. And I've messed with the Atreyu Kempers a little bit, mm -hmm. trying to dial theirs in. But you can't, like, let's just say you. From what I understand, like if you profile your Kemper, right? And let's just say we have for some weird reason you wanted to re you wanted to profile your amp at the settings of bass at 10 mids at zero treble at 10 right and the gain cranked all the way up uh -huh. now when you profile that 
and you go and download the profile, your knobs are at 12, 12, 12, and yep. 12, mm -hmm. right? So you'll never be able to bring those mids back up to where they would on a real amp. Yeah. Uh -huh. Or to where your amp would have been mm -hmm. because it's been profiled in a manipulated way. So, which I guess you could use that information to create tones that could not be possible in real life. Say for instance, if you wanted to profile it at full tilt mm -hmm. mids yeah. and then crank even more mids later on the, on the Kemper. Yeah. Which is just, what tone zone are you in? That's what Queens I- Queens of the Stone Age. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, right? all, yeah, only mids. Yeah. <laughs> But, but you know what I mean though? Like, like, yeah. so that was always my problem with it where it was like, okay, like this isn't, and like even the mid, low and highs was never the same frequency range and they don't respond the same as if you were to change it on the amp itself. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what I like about the Axe Effects is like being able, and also too, just being able to create a tone mm -hmm. rather than starting from a download or, or yeah a, and that's kind of the difference in those yeah. things and axe effects i've i've always said i i mean i prefer using a real head live um 5153 mm -hmm. and using the axe 2 or axe 3 for effects yeah. through the um i guess four cable method effects yeah. loop and all that stuff because i love the delays all, all yeah, that yeah. stuff the automation that yeah um which is something you kind of introduced me to mostly i had like dabbled but you were just like well have you learned this right and just all the live automation yeah like the whammy dives and yeah the filters and stuff love that love that so i think it just adds more to um the arsenal of ideas we got we have all the endorsements out of the way all the you know, it's it's tough for me because I have so many endorsements that are kind of like non-guitar player related to. They're more like producer. Like we'd be here for another thirty minutes, and people would be like, "Sonox, what is that?" You know what I mean? Like, like what is what is <laughs> we'll do that for what the is next podcast? STL then. tones. Yeah. What is that? You yeah. know. Like, I do have a signature drum sample library. Ooh, yes. That's okay, let's talk about those real quick. So that is through. Room Sound, roomsound.com. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are a drum sample library. Uh, they've done basically a, what a drum sample library is, for those of you that don't know, is inside of your computer recording system, whatever you're using, you can pull up this little software, has a picture of a drum set. And what we did is we went to a studio and we mic'd it up with like tons of expensive mics going through a big console. And we recorded each piece of that drum kit like a hundred times at all different velocities. So you can type in the notes or even play it on a keyboard or on a virtual drum set. And you can basically typewriter in a drum beat. Yeah. You can write a drum beat basically on your own. So you can have a drummer play on your album without even having a drummer, I guess, yeah. you know, yeah. which is what we all do now when we write songs, yeah. you know, it's like we write the guitar riff and we say, Oh, I want the drums to go boom, boom, ka, boom, 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 ka. you know, we uh -huh. just type it in uh, and there it is. is. What I want. Do you feel like, because back in the day, it was like, man, the snare sounds great. Like all the right. hard shells sound great, but cymbals, do you feel like they've come a long way to, wow, yeah, cymbals are like kind of believable now. Right. Well, I think a lot of that has to do with production trends itself too. Mm -hmm. Like I think nowadays people want the cymbals so low that yeah, it's like, yeah. that it's like, well, yeah, they sound pretty real. You're like, really? Because I can't, <laughs> I can't hear them at all. Low. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, I, I guess they sound real if you can hear them yeah you know yeah. but yeah for real like it's always like guitars are super loud mm -hmm. cymbals are like the quietest thing ever you know but like but they still want to hear every little detail and everything you know yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. really strange i like cymbals just being they're just tickling the eardrums mm -hmm. but i i like the attack of a cymbal hit i'm like i don't always need it i mean i right. love a good china like a china yeah. can pop through and right <laughs> i'm happy please any records that you're listening to right now that are kind of getting you stoked um or are inspiring I've been listening to that Naira record a lot. Yeah, German Thrashers. Yeah, yeah. I toured with them a bunch. That's I great. Like, yeah. I like that record a lot. Kind of reminds me of Unearth a little bit. Like just total like that kind of uh, early two thousands metalcore. Oh, you for know. sure. Yeah, yeah. Evergrey. <laughs> oh, okay. Loving Evergrey. Any sort of like kind of power metal esque type yeah. thing right now. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm super into. Again, because I'm kind of looking to be inspired for those. Um, did we talk about that? Like the black, no, that was a different conversation. Black album being an inspirational record with like yeah. riffs that you can remember. I'm kind of looking for those, those influential 
songs that I might hear or stumble across and you're just kind of like, oh, I love the feeling that gives me, you know, and it's just like mm -hmm. a riff that's just a very simple thing, but you're like, wow, it's so memorable. Well, dude, thanks so much for yeah. doing my first podcast and good seeing and just hanging out with you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for tuning into the Raise the Bridge podcast. For more information, visit philscrasso.com slash raise the bridge. 